Here we are. Welcome to the Buffer Systems Lab. Usually we'd be in person doing this really cool lab with titrators and beakers and a bunch of cool stuff. Unfortunately, we're going to have to do this virtually, but I've tried to put together something that gives you an idea of what we would be doing so you can understand the main concepts. Off we go. Of course, we have to do a little bit of background. This lab is about buffer systems, so let's make sure that we talk about what buffer systems are. Now, we're talking about chemical buffer systems, and as you probably already have learned from lecture, chemical buffer systems are series of chemicals or groups of chemicals that circulate in the bloodstream all the time. And their sole existence, their only job, is to help resist fluctuations in blood pH. You know, our blood pH has a very narrow normal range. So our normal blood pH really needs to stay between 7.35 and 7.45. There's other fluids in our body where we can withstand a slightly bigger range of healthy values for pH, but that is most definitely not true for blood pH. If we start to get out of this range, we are almost in immediate danger. So in the short term, it is the job of our chemical buffers to resist changes because that's going to happen. Frequently, we have acid that is going to be building up in our body. Maybe it's ketones, maybe it's lactate, maybe it's CO2, maybe it's hydrogen ions. So in the course of a day or in the course of life, you're going to have moments when acid builds up or base builds up. So when we have these normal fluctuations, what's going to happen is these chemical buffer systems activate and help to resist. So if we have acid building up, these chemical buffer systems will show up and they'll provide some base to counteract the acid to maintain that blood pH within that range. Okay, um, each chemical buffer system must contain a weak acid, a weak base, and hydrogen ions. Pay attention to the fact that these utilize weak bases. We don't want strong acids and bases because these dissociate completely. So we know that acids release hydrogen in a fluid. So a strong acid will release hydrogen completely and fully through that fluid. But here we don't want we don't want these acids and bases to dissociate completely. So what happens in a weak acid is it does release hydrogen ions but those hydrogen ions do not dissociate or do not dissolve completely through the fluid. And the reason why this is good is because this makes the actions of the chemical buffer systems more reversible. So when needed, we can release some hydrogen ions to make something more acidic, or we can take up some hydrogen. And the it's capable of doing this in the short term because our acids and bases don't dissociate completely. They're weak, so they dissociate a little bit, which allows them to release some acid or pick up, excuse me, release hydrogen or pick up hydrogen, but it's not a complete reaction. So we can go back and forth as we need. So this just talks about an overview of how these chemical buffers work. As I said, they're able to resist a pH change because they can act as either an acid or a base, whatever is needed at a certain time to bring pH back to normal. If the blood becomes a little bit acidic, we're going to want to dissociate the base. On the other hand, if the blood becomes too alkaline, we're going to want to dissociate oh, we're going to want to dissociate the acid. So this group of chemicals is able to dissociate whatever it needs to help bring pH back to normal. Within each chemical buffer system, 
It's going to convert the strong into weak acids and bases. We talked about why. And I just want to make sure that we know that these are short-term results. The chemical buffer systems are short-term. It's our immediate fix to help keep blood pH within a normal range. It's not meant to be long-lasting. Its effects are not overall that great, but it's a short-term fix until we can activate the urinary and respiratory systems. These systems are able to do better long-term buffering, but they just can't happen immediately. So we have the best of both worlds. We have the chemical buffers that can act in the short term until we can activate our respiratory and urinary systems to get longer term and more complete pH buffering and regulation. So I wanna give you an example. Um, I discussed this in, in the lecture video, but one of the common buff chemical buffer systems is the carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system. This is the most commonly used buffer system in the extracellular fluid, like the blood. The blood is considered extracellular. And this is the equation. You do not, at least for my labs, you do not have to know the specific equations themselves by symbol. But I want you to understand the basis of these equations. For example, I want to point out that these reactions are reversible. That's the idea of a chemical buffer system. We can shift this equation to the right or to the left as needed to either release some acid or base, whatever is needed to bring pH back to normal. Okay, so the first characteristic to notice is that these chemical buffer systems, these groups of chemicals are reversible in their reactions. I also want to point out, as we already discussed, each chemical buffer system contains a weak acid, a weak base, and hydrogen ions. So let's fill this out. This happens to be carbonic acid, which is a weak acid. Again, you don't have to know the symbols, but I'm just pointing out that we have a weak acid, and we also have a weak base. Ooh. This is bicarbonate. So here we have a weak acid and a weak base and hydrogen ions. So does this chemical buffer system have all the ingredients that we need? Weak acid, weak base, and hydrogen ions? It sure does. So I did this by hand and I apologize, it's not the neatest but it was easier for me to do it by hand this way before I got to the video. So here we have the carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system, a chemical buffer system that does its thing in the extracellular fluid. Let's think of an example. If the blood becomes too acidic, if the blood becomes too acidic, do we want this chemical buffer system to release a weak acid or a weak base? I think sometimes students overthink this. From a large view, we can be very simple. If the blood becomes too acidic, what do we want to release to bring it back to normal? The weak base, right? What color could I use? Let's use, I like purple. All right. If the blood becomes too acidic, we're going to want to release the weak base to bring it back to normal. So if the blood goes one direction in the pH, we release the opposite to temporarily bring pH back to normal. So if the blood becomes too acidic, we're going to dissociate or aka release the weak base. But I also like to point out is that when the blood becomes too acidic, and we dissociate the weak base, this top equation moves to the left. You don't need to know the um, formula itself, but I could very well ask you questions. In the carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system, if the blood becomes too acidic, what is gonna dissociate to help fix it? And you would answer the weak base. I could also ask you, 
in the carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system if the blood becomes too acidic? In order to fix it, which direction will the formula move? And if the blood becomes too acidic, we're going to dissociate the base and the formula moves to the left. That's just memorization. I have given you the formula for what it looks like when bicarbonate dissociates. So here's bicarbonate here. Here's bicarbonate dissociating. You don't have to know that specific formula of how bicarbonate dissociates. Oh, there's my cat. She's saying hi. Hi, Kima. What happens is anytime the blood becomes too acidic, the weak base dissociates. And what happens is when the weak base dissociates, when the formula moves to the left, water is formed. Right? Extra hydrogen is picked up to form water. And in order to form water, we need two hydrogen and one oxygen, H2O. So think about it. If the blood's too acidic, we've got too many hydrogen ions floating around. Because as we know, whenever you have a solution with too much hydrogen, it becomes acidic. So our initial problem is we have too many hydrogen ions, too acidic. To fix it, we're going to release the weak base. And what the weak base does as it dissociates is it forms water. By forming water, we take hydrogen out of the blood to temporarily store it as water, thus, re thus reducing the amount of free hydrogen ions in the blood and bringing pH back up to normal. <laughs> There's my cat again. Okay, so the key thing is, whenever we dissociate the weak base, it gets rid of hydrogen ions by temporarily forming water. It takes, takes hydrogen out of the solution and it temporarily binds it up as water, which in turn takes hydrogen out of the solution and increases the pH back to normal. What happens if I ask you the opposite question? Here's our same formula at the top, the carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system. And what if I ask you, what happens if the blood becomes too alkaline? So if the pH starts to rise out of a normal level, what do we want to do? Well, you can already probably guess it. If the blood becomes too alkaline, we're going to want to release the weak acid. And when the weak acid dissociates, it moves the formula to the right. Really, if you just memorize one in terms of the direction of the, for the formula moving, you'll automatically know the other. Anytime the weak acid dissociates, the equation moves to the right. I've given you the formula here for what happens when carbonic acid dissociates. Right Here's a carbonic acid. It's dissociating. But you don't need to know that formula specifically. All you need to know is any time that a weak acid dissociates, it adds hydrogen to the solution. And as you can see, when the equation goes to the right, what are we adding? Hydrogen ions. So any time the blood becomes too alkaline, we're going to want to dissociate the weak acid to counteract it. Any time we dissociate the weak acid, this whole formula moves to the right. And in moving to the right, we release hydrogen ions. If our initial problem was not enough hydrogen ions, too much hydroxyl, OH negative, not enough hydrogen, we're going to temporarily fix it by adding hydrogen to the solution. Okay, now that those were all examples of a carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system. That's all great and well. But today, in today's lab, we're going to be using the phosphate buffer system. And the phosphate buffer system is a group of chemicals that are more active inside the cells, in the intracellular fluid. But guess what? We're going to have the same components. So you don't have to know the equation, but I'm just showing you. We can see it's reversible, which lets us be able to dissociate a weak acid or weak base as needed. 
And here we have on this side, this is our weak acid. My cat wants to play right now, of course. And this is our weak base. So we have a weak acid and a weak base, and of course, hidden in there are gonna be some hydrogen ions. The basics of how this buffer system works are the same as a carbonic acid bicarbonate. If the blood becomes too acidic, we're gonna to wanna to dissociate the weak base. If the blood becomes too alkaline, we're gonna to wanna to dissociate the weak acid. All right, last couple things to introduce before we get to the lab. In this lab, we're gonna be measuring pH two ways, all right? We're gonna be measuring pH using pH strips, good old fashioned pH strips. And we're also gonna be measuring pH using indicator solutions, which as we've done in previous labs, think back to AMP1 probably, indicator solutions turn the solution a certain color. And that certain color tells you about the pH. In the actual lab handout, um, I think the way that they talk about these indicators, thymol blue and brom thymol blue, are perhaps the most complicated thing on the face of the earth. So I put together my little hand-drawn color scale, which I think is pretty cool. So you may wanna refer back to this today during the lab, okay? Um, we have two different indicator solutions we're gonna use, and they sound really similar, so you just gotta be careful. We have thymol blue, and then we have brom thymol blue. Let's look at thymol blue. And look at the colors underneath the pH scale. So anytime we add thymol blue to a solution, that solution will turn red if the pH is between zero and one. That solution will turn a peach color if the pH of that solution is between one and a half and two and a half or three. Do you see what I, how, how this works? If you add thymol blue and the solution turns yellow, then the pH is somewhere between three and eight and so forth. And then for brom thymol blue, you can see if we add brom thymol blue, if the solution turns yellow, the pH is somewhere between zero and six. If the solution turns green with brom thymol blue, then the pH is somewhere between six and seven, and so forth. There's a couple reasons, there's many reasons why we're gonna be measuring pH in two ways. One of them is just to get more accuracy. So if we do it two ways, we're gonna get better accuracy. Also, we wanna make sure that we get the right number. So what if the pH strips aren't functioning properly? Then we have another way to do it. Also, um, you'll see later when we get to procedures two and three, we're gonna be adding drops of either hydrochloric acid or sodium bicarbonate drop by drop. And it saves us using the indicators. Instead of having after each drop to use a pH strip, we can simply just add drop after drop after drop after drop more quickly. And then we can look for a color change. All right. Let's get into the lab because I'm excited about the lab. This lab has four parts. Part one is gonna be a control, just gonna see how things change color in a buffer solution versus a water control. Then we're gonna see how much acid the buffer and the water can handle. Then we're gonna see how much base the buffer fluid versus the water can handle. And then we're gonna use our own CO2 to add acid. Okay, so, this really follows exactly what's in your lab objective sheet. The lab objective sheet is gonna have you get in lab two beakers, and we're gonna label one beaker A, and we're gonna label the other beaker B. These are 50 mil beakers. Then it's gonna tell us to add fluid to both. So to beaker A, we're gonna add 10 mils of distilled water, And actually to beaker B, we're also gonna add 10 mils of distilled water. And then to both, we're gonna add an indicator. I'm gonna use purple as the color for the indicators. 
but to both fluids, we're going to add four drops of the Brom Thymol Blue. It's happening for both. And that's our indicator. After it does that, after we set it up, we're going to use the pH strips to take the pH. And using the pH strips, you can see that these little strips have colors on them. It shows you orange, white, and peach. Um, you dip that into the water, and then you hold up the pH strip to the box that the pH strips came in. And based on the color that these little pads change, you get the pH. Using the pH strip, both were a pH of 7, which is pretty neutral, which is what we would expect of distilled water. So we have two beakers of distilled water with an indicator solution at a neutral pH. Cool. Now, the instructions are going to tell you in the lab to add sodium bicarbonate to beaker A only. Sodium bicarbonate is a base, right? We had the carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system. So we're adding, we're adding sodium bicarbonate to beaker A. So now we have weak base in with our fluid. I gotta hit done to change colors, which is what I've discovered here. So we have the weak base with our fluid. And then beaker B stays the same, no base. We're going to take the pH again. And the pH now should change because we've added sodium bicarbonate to beaker A. So the pH for beaker A using the pH strip is 8.5. Instead of being 7 as it was in the previous slide, now it becomes a little bit more alkaline because we've added the base. And our pH for beaker B remains at 7. So what are we doing here? Now we're making beaker A our buffer beaker because we've added some base. And beaker B stays as our control. Now, you can see on the right here, I've included the Brom Thymol Blue scale because as we saw in the previous slide, we added the Brom Thymol Blue. So not only can we assess pH by the pH strip, we can also assess pH by the color change. I'm gonna write in purple what the colors are because purple is gonna be our indicator, right? So we think about purple. We added Brom Thymol Blue. So what happens is this is going to stay blue and this is going to become a little bit lighter blue in, col in color. And if I look at the here, we can see that blue indicates that our pH is anywhere from 8 to 14. Kind of a wide range, but we know that we're within a little bit neutral to higher. Okay, so remember, here we have, let's go to black here, oh, black, beaker A became our buffer because we added sodium hydroxide, right? And beaker B was our control. <laughs> Hi, Kima, my kitty again. So to both beakers, now we're gonna add hydrochloric acid. So we're gonna add acid. Let's make acid red. So we're gonna add hydrochloric acid to both. Hydrochloric acid is very acidic. So think about it for a minute. When you add hydrochloric acid to both of these, what's gonna happen to the pH? Let's first look at the control. If I add hydrochloric acid to water, the pH using the pH strip is going to become very acidic. So we were at a pH of 7, 
but by adding 10 drops of hydrochloric acid, now the pH has gone down. But what's going to happen to beaker A? It contains some base in it already, which is going to help buffer against the effects of that hydrochloric acid. So guess what? Even with 10 drops of hydrochloric acid, the pH of beaker A is 8.5. So it does not become acidic, even though we added hydrochloric acid. That is the effect of the buffer. And that is phenomenal. This is going to be, in essence, what our chemical buffer systems do in our body. Let's talk about the colors. So we did the pH strips in black. And I'm going to tell you what colors these turn. Beaker B, because we added 10 drops of hydrochloric acid to water only, this whole solution turns yellow. Imagine what I'm drawing in here is yellow. What does yellow tell us with brom thymol blue? The solution is acidic. But guess what? In beaker A, it stayed that light blue, which goes along with what the pH strip told us. So cool. Great. Let's move on to procedure two. Now, procedures two and three are basically the same thing, the same setup. It's just that one contains, one, we're adding acid until the solutions turn acidic, and the other, we're adding base until the solutions turn basic. So procedure two, our first one, how much acid can be absorbed by a buffer fluid versus a beaker of water? So let's get our setup going here. Perfect. So to beaker B, we're going to add 10 mils of distilled water. Boom. To beaker A, we're going to add 10 mils of our buffer. So in the lab, we actually have a little container which contains buffer fluid. And we can surmise that in this buffer fluid, we have a weak acid, a weak base, and hydrogen ions, which makes beaker B our control. Simply water, no, no buffers. Now to both, we're going to add our indicator. In this case, our indicator is going to be thymol blue, not brom thymol blue. But the instructions are going to tell us to both fluids, we're going to add four drops of the thymol blue, which is the indicator. All right. Now we need some baseline numbers. So we're going to do our baseline pH test strips. So as we would expect, beaker B is our control. And it's going to have a pH of 7. And beaker B with our buffer with a pH strip is going to have a pH of 7.5. Sometimes we'll see a little bit of a difference. But in both cases, the solution, and in this case it's okay because it's in a beaker, it's not in our body, is fairly neutral. We're also going to see the color and we can tell the pH based off of the color of the solution. Beaker B, our control, is going to be yellow. And guess what? Beaker A is also going to be yellow. And with thymol blue, solutions turn yellow when the pH is neutral. So these numbers make sense. Now, Here's where we get to the titrator. So in the lab, we have this titrator. And this lab looks really cool because you have these really tall titrators sitting on top of the labs. And you can see there's a little knob here on the right. And that knob, when it's horizontal, means that nothing can come out. But when you slowly start to twist that knob clockwise, we're going to start to let drops come out into the beaker and it allows us a lot of control over that fluid okay 
So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be adding hydrochloric acid. Boom. Because that's what procedure two is. We're adding acid. We're going to start with beaker A. And if you remember from the slide above, as you can actually probably still see it with how this looks, beaker A is our buffer. We had 10 mils of our buffer fluid in there. So what this lab asks you to do is it asks you to take that little knob, turn it clockwise slightly, and we're going to start to release drops of hydrochloric acid into the beaker. You're going to be counting how many drops you have to add until the color of the fluid inside the beaker turns peach. And let's look at the thymol blue scale. We want to see how many drops it takes for this buffer fluid to turn peach. And when this buffer fluid turns peach, we know the pH is around two, which means it's acidic. So we're gonna see how many drops of hydrochloric acid does it take to turn the buffer solution acidic? Do you have any guesses? Jeopardy waiting noise. Because what we're gonna do is, is we're gonna compare this to how many drops it takes to add to beaker B. And remember, beaker B is our control. So the same thing is gonna happen. We're gonna add hydrochloric acid to water. And we wanna see how many drops does it take, how many drops of hydrochloric acid does it take to turn the water acidic? How many drops will it take to turn this peach? And peach equals a pH of 2, which equals acidic. So the first basic question you could ask yourself is, which will take more drops? Will it take more drops to turn the solution acidic when the beaker contains water or when the beaker contains the buffer? If you're following along with me, you know the answer. Let me tell you the answers. Boom. Let's see if I, I even have a peach, right? So beaker A was our buffer. Look at that beautiful peach color. How many drops of hydrochloric acid did it take to turn this fluid peach? Usually in the labs, it takes about 90 drops. Seriously, 90 drops. Why does it take so long? Because we have the buffer system. If we're adding acid, if we're adding acid, what part of the buffer is going to dissociate? The weak base. So we have the weak base dissociating for as long as it can. And it keeps this fluid, the yellow color, which is neutral, until eventually, eventually, the weak base can no longer withstand the onslaught of acid. But it took a long time. Imagine how powerful these chemical buffer systems are in your blood. So we have a buildup of lactate, no big deal. We just have some weak base dissociating and we can handle it. Let's compare this to how many drops it takes to turn the water. And this should not be surprising because in our control, we added hydrochloric acid to water. And it took about, oh, let me go up here, 10 drops for this fluid. So it didn't take very much at all. The control was just water. So it only took about 10 drops to turn the whole fluid apricot or peach to get a pH of two. So we compare 90 drops with the buffer to only 10 drops with the control. If our blood was only water without the buffers, 
It wouldn't take very much acid at all to turn our whole bloodstream acidic. That would be bad. So we have these chemical buffers to counteract that change. So at the end, we're going to have our two beakers. And now they're both going to be filled with the peach solution. Okay. Beaker A was our buffer. Beaker B was our control. It took 10 drops of hydrochloric acid to turn this whole solution acidic in the control, and it took 90 drops within the buffer. Last thing you'd be doing in this lab is that you would be taking the pH, oop, you'd be taking the pH test strip. So again, we're taking pH in multiple ways. With the pH test strip, we would see a pH. If you got these to the same shade of peach, you'd probably get a pH of around two, which goes along with the thymol blue indicator scale. All right. So if we go back to this equation, again, you don't have to know the exact equation symbols, but I do want to point out what's happening on a broad scale. So remember, in our lab, we're talking about the phosphate buffer system. And here we have the weak acid. This is actually dihydrogen phosphate. Excuse me. And then we have the weak base, which is actually monohydrogen phosphate. But my question to you is, when we were adding hydrochloric acid, which is going to dissociate? And of course, you know, right, just like we had in our example with a carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system, if the blood becomes too acidic, which is like what we were doing with adding hydrochloric acid, we're going to want to dissociate the weak base. You don't have to know this exact equation, but know the basics. If we added acid, we want the weak base to dissociate. Anytime the weak base dissociates, it forms water. And in order to form water, we have to pick up hydrogen to form the water. And by picking up hydrogen, it removes the hydrogen from the solution, therefore bringing the pH back up to normal. All right. Procedure three is a similar idea, only now we're going to see how much base can be absorbed, how many drops it will take with the acid and the base. Our starting point is going to be pretty much the same. Beaker B is going to have 10 mils of distilled water, and that's our control. Same setup as before. Beaker A is going to have our buffer. But we're using purple to demonstrate the buffer in this video. And then to both, we're going to be adding our indicator solution, which, as it was for procedure two, is thymol blue. We're going to take the pH of both to get a starting pH using the pH strips. Using the pH strips, we get a pH of about 7, which is what we would expect. Pretty neutral. I'm going to look at the color. Both are going to be yellow because the fluid's going to be yellow. Because using the thymol blue, if the pH is 7, what color is it going to be? Yellow. This time, we're adding sodium hydroxide. Let's look at beaker A. Beaker A has our buffer, remember? So let's fill this in. Beaker A has 10 mils of our buffer solution. Beaker A started off as a yellow color. In this case, we're waiting to see how many drops, in this case of base, how many drops of sodium hydroxide does it take for the whole fluid to become blue. In procedure two, we were looking for the color change to a peach color. Here we're looking for a color change to blue, because what does blue tell us? That the whole solution is becoming alkaline. 
So I ask you the same question. Here we have beaker A set up with the buffer. If I go ahead a little bit, we're going to have beaker B set up. And remember, beaker B just has the water, which is our control. Both solutions start off as yellow. Right, and you can see on the thymol blue scale, yellow is about neutral, 7 pH. And we want to see how many drops it takes for the solution to turn blue, which is going to take more. You know the answer, but the question is by how much? Let me tell you. Usually in this lab, let me use the blue like this. Usually with the buffer, it takes somewhere around 40 drops to turn that fluid blue. And blue indicates alkaline. Takes about four drops. What about for our control? Right, we added, we added to B. Usually for the control, it takes a similar about as it did in experiment two, about 10 drops to turn this blue. So we have 40 drops it took for the buffer, 40 drops for the buffer, and only 10 drops for the control. So we have, in the end, we have now two fluids that are both blue. And that blue indicates on the thymol blue scale that we have a high pH or alkaline. We're going to do the test strips, urine or the pH test strips. And in this case, as long as you get it to the same shade of blue, our pH strips will tell us the pH of both is about 11. And that goes along with the color turning blue. Again, using the equations, you don't have to know them specifically, but I would like you to know what's going to be dissociating. Here, we added an alkaline solution. So if we had an alkaline solution, do we want the weak acid to dissociate or the weak base to dissociate? You know the answer. If we have too much alkaline, we want the weak acid to dissociate. We have it's too much, it's too base, too alkaline, so we're going to want to dissociate the weak acid. Anytime a weak acid dissociates, we're adding hydrogen. Our initial problem was the solution was too basic, didn't have enough hydrogen. So by dissociating the weak acid, we add hydrogen, and the pH goes back to normal. All right, last procedure. In the last procedure, we're going to be adding our own form of acid, to see what happens. And in our own form of acid, let's go to this, look at this great picture. We're gonna, in the lab, you blow into the fluid with a straw. So let's talk about this. We're gonna start much like we had before. You know the drill, we have two beakers. Both beakers are going to have 10 mils of water. And then to both beakers, we're gonna add an indicator solution. We happen to be back to the Brom thymol blue. So we add our indicators. So it'll change colors. All right, so we have beaker A, beaker B. All right. And then we take the pH with a pH test strip. So here, our pH using the pH test strip is going to be about 7, which is neutral. And actually, even though I have it written in as blue, the color starts off as green. So we have a green solution with a pH of 7 with the test strips, and that makes sense. Okay. Let me just check my notes for one second. All right. We do add some buffer to beaker A. So before I go on here, because I didn't include this in the step, we have 
Let's see, let's go to purple. We have two beakers of distilled water. Beaker B is water only, so it's our control. But beaker B, we also added some buffer. So here we have two beakers, like we have had all along. Beaker A has the buffer. Beaker B has nothing. It just has the water. So what you would do, let's start with beaker B. Beaker B is our control, right? Beaker B is just water, so it's our control. How are we adding our own acid? Because we're adding CO2. In procedure two, we added hydrochloric acid from a titrator. But the response is the same no matter what kind of acid you're adding. We know that when CO2 builds up, it is acidic. So looking at the Brom thymol blue scale, and here maybe I can write this in to help you understand. We start with a pH of seven. So the fluid inside the beaker started as green. When you start to add your own CO2, what color do you expect the fluid to become? You guessed it, it's gonna become yellow because what does the yellow mean on our Brom thymol blue scale? Acidic. So because beaker B was only the control, no buffer, literally immediately when you add CO2, the whole fluid turns yellow. And if I do the pH strip, which I'll just do it on the same slide here. If you do the pH strip, so you've added your own acid. We see that it's yellow, so we can tell by the indicator. And usually the pH after you add your own CO2 is about five with the pH strip. So not quite as acidic as it was with the hydrochloric acid because what is? There's nothing really as acidic as hydrochloric acid, but it still becomes acidic. Now we skip ahead to beaker A, and beaker A was our buffer. So now we're blowing CO2 into a different beaker that has the buffer. The lab book says to add CO2 for two minutes. The solution starts off as green. When you blow into this thing for two minutes, is it gonna change color? no color change. It stays green because of the buffer system. People in lab will often become blue on the face because they are trying to add so much acid, but no matter how much you can blow in, it doesn't change. And then if we do the pH test strip, the pH test strip is going to show us that the pH stays about the same. It's actually a really cool experiment. All right, so that's all to walk you through what we would be doing in the lab. Now it's your turn to answer some questions and make a graph. Good luck.